you today? I don't know about you. I'm stoked. All right. Uh, we had a great 8 o'clock service. It was great fun. Um, 1045 service. We've got a couple of special things to do that you all are going to miss out on. Uh, we have a baby dedication. Marion Dinar, Tog, and Joan uh, get to be present for the dedication of their first great grandson. All right? They have a great granddaughter, but this is their first great grandson. And it just happens the middle name is Marion. So the Dinar Togs will be quite excited in the last service. Also, uh, our family has a special uh, privilege and treat. I'm going to have a baptism. Uh, just for one, somebody was saying, we didn't know about it. We didn't, I wanted to get, the, the, this was one we didn't announce and prepare for. Um, the, this is a second cousin by marriage, but uh, more like my niece, all right? More like my niece, and her name is Emily. She's 13 years old. Uh, she's an absolutely delightful young girl, and uh, she has a heart for the Lord. I uh, had the opportunity of answering questions one night. Uh, that she had, and uh, over the next several hours after that, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And so a couple of months ago, she told her mom, Mom, can we go up to Clovis, and, and can Tim baptize me? And so that started the conversation, and we worked out the details, and they could all be here, uh, grandparents and all, uh, today. And so they're going to be in the 1045 service. Got to try out the new baptistry works. Okay, automatic fill, automatic heat. All right, I didn't have to watch it so it wouldn't overflow, though I did, because I was afraid, would it really work? All right, you know, faith comes into play here. Uh, and so, uh, but I didn't make trips every 15 minutes. I did it. it filled up in 45 minutes, shut itself off, heater came on, it's now 92 degrees. <laughs> I said, cut it back, man, I'm going to go to sleep in there. Uh, but anyway, it, it was pretty cool, so that's going to be in the last service. But welcome. Thanks for being at our uh, 915 service. If you are a guest, it's your first time here, there's some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill one out, drop it in the offering bag in a little bit. We make promises here. We're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to bother you on the phone. We're not going to sell your address. Uh, but we will send you some information this coming week through the mail that will tell you about New Hope Church, about the staff, about what we believe and what our service opportunities are. And so we'd love to get that information in your hand, and um, thank you so very much for filling that out. Those cards are also available for our own church family to use to give us information uh, uh, regarding address changes, email changes, uh, prayer requests, praise items. Uh, you want a meeting with part of the staff, use those cards for that, and we'll, we address those uh, every Tuesday morning. So uh, thank you so much for filling those out. I want to say a special thanks today to our associate pastor, Mark Addis, sitting right over there. What a great job he did last Sunday morning preaching the word to you all, all right? Um, he was preparing on that weekend to head for uh, camp where he spent uh, all week with 19 uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Uh, I had prepared him earlier in the week that maybe I might not, because of the knee surgery, be able to stand for all three. And uh, on Friday when I met with uh, the physical therapist, I said, can I preach on Sunday? It's three services. And he said, well, can you lean on a stool? And I said, sure. And he said, well, that's okay. And I said, well, now then I have to come back Sunday night and preach. He said, choose one. So, uh, so Mark, I called him and he said, it's ready. And boy, was he ready. So thank you so very, very much, Mark. I might be gone more often now. Um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, let me highlight a few announcements and then a couple of prayer requests that uh, are in the bulletin as well as I've been handed today. Um, Fawn Boss, why don't you come up? Ladies first. Ladies first. Good morning. We have an exciting day on the New Hope campus on Saturday, um, August 26th. We have a women's event. We're having a movie here in the sanctuary. Uh, this is the movie we talked about a couple months ago. It came out the theater. We tried to do a church-wide thing and couldn't get the theater. So now we're going to show it here. It's a funny movie. I want to encourage you all to come and bring a friend that doesn't go to church or a relative that maybe doesn't always go and they're afraid of going in. Because this movie is a funny view about going to church. And it kind of takes away the angst of going inside a strange place that they might feel when they watch it. And it can show how funny Christians can be. Funny people, right? <laughs> Oh, so, uh, yes, too. But come, it's a great movie. Um, we're going to provide uh, snacks for you, and uh, we'll have some chocolate there, a movie and fellowship. We're going to have a door prize, and the tickets are only a dollar a piece. You can't beat the price. And they're on sale today out of the building after the service. So 
so get them while we've got them. But that's not the end of it. It gets even better. After we're done at 5 o'clock, we open those doors. The men are having their chili dip cook off that day, so we don't even have to eat dinner. Just come to the movie, enjoy yourself, go right on out, meet your family there if they want you to come to the uh, cook off. And if you don't want to stay, you can purchase the food and take it home, and you still don't have to cook dinner. So to me, it's an unbeatable day. We'll be chocolate and then cookies. I mean, it's perfect other than getting your shoes along with it. We can't do that. So, so get yourselves out there. All the tickets are good. They're a dollar out of the billion. And if you want to get the chili cook-off tickets, uh, Mark, you'll, you'll recognize the tables because the women have the tablecloth and pictures and sprite. And then Mark's on his side is a ticket. <laughs> There's a challenge throw down for next week. Thank you, Fawn, for uh, talking about that. It should be a great day around here that Saturday, so we hope you come and participate in all those various things. Uh, this coming Tuesday, we also have the Senior Luncheon, and uh, what an excellent speaker you have. Her name is Connie Clendenin. She has been the uh, Director and CEO of Valley Teen Ranch for well over two decades. She is as vibrant and as excitable a speaker as you will ever come across. I've known Connie for probably close to 40 years and uh, she is a pistol, and so you're going to enjoy. She will not put you to sleep, trust me. So we want you to be here for the Senior Luncheon this Tuesday. Um, a week from tonight will be the last of our sizzling summer Sunday night schedules, all right? Uh, how many of you came last week? How many here? Uh, it, was, it was joy and laughter. Did you laugh? Did you walk away more joyful? <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Plus, we ended with ice cream. So everybody went away smiling, all right? Uh, we had a great time. We'll have our last one next Sunday night. And then uh, it appears we're going to be kicking off on a regular basis every Sunday night after Labor Day weekend. But we'll keep you posted uh, about that. Uh, by the way, Shelly and I have seen the movie you all are going to see on uh, the Women's Day. It is a great movie. It was hilarious. A lot of fun and also had a very, very good message. Um, August the 27th, Sunday, August the 27th, we're going to have a church-wide meeting right after the third service. That gives you guys in this service time to go have a quick brunch, breakfast, and come back and join us at about 12, 15, 12, 20, somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, uh, probably not more than a half-hour meeting, but there's a few things we need to share with you. Number one, we've got about six new deacons to present to you, all right, uh, men and women, all right, who are uh, excited, enthused about serving our church in the capacity of, of deacons. Uh, this is an area of our church we sort of let lapse in terms of uh, new people being available and putting them to good use in ministry and service as the apostles did back in the first century church. So uh, there's been a very concerted effort and we've had several people respond in the affirmative and it's been exciting. So we can't wait to present all of them to you for your approval so they can serve us. Uh, the second thing we're going to talk about, as you've kind of been aware if you've been coming the last few months, we've been in various stages of remodel work, all right? We've redone the bathrooms, the uh, rock back wall, uh, the wood floor, the uh, baptistry, which is at 92 degrees now, all right? Uh, so those are some of the, the upgrades. We're going to give you an update on where we are and our expenses with that. And then I have a favor to ask. Um, you've heard the old statement, uh, sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. And I have used that on occasions. But this is one of those times in which it might be too much forgiveness to ask for. So I'm going to ask permission first, all right? Um, you all gave approval for the remodel work of the sanctuary, and it's rapidly coming to a conclusion. Uh, but how many, and many of you probably don't use the bathrooms in that building. How many of you have? You've been over that building? Okay. And you walk in our other bathrooms in the church. How do those bathrooms look? Really? Yeah, that's a man talking, yeah. No, they don't. And particularly in the men's room, where little boys miss, and the side walls are rusty. All right? So, I mean, I could have said, well, let's remodel and it's really close to the sanctuary. Let's just do it. But it's not. It's, it's not the sanctuary building. So I'm going, I'm going to ask your permission to let's upgrade those bathrooms so that everything, all the bathrooms around here look nice and good. 
Um, those also get used a lot, all right, by uh, the most important person at a wedding, because the bridal room is right there, and also they get used a lot by memorial families, because that's often the room that the families wait in uh, when they choose to before a service starts or after a service is over uh, to gather themselves before they head to a reception. So uh, th those are going to be the, some things that we're going to talk about. So it shouldn't take long, but we do want to share those things with you. Please take note of Grief Share that is going to be launching again, the times and the dates, uh, beginning the end of August. If you've experienced a loss in your family recently, uh, or even not so recently, but it still brings a challenge for you. Uh, it's kind of a hump you just can't quite seem to get over. I would heartily recommend Grief Share. It is a wonderful, wonderful Bible study support group scenario, and uh, you would benefit from it greatly. Let me uh, highlight a couple of things that are in here. Um, uh, Rick Watt is, a, uh, is, is an attender of New Hope, and uh, Rick Watt, you've seen the commercials, uh, Help, I Fell, and I Can't Get Up. Uh, Rick Watt is exactly one of those. He fell in his bathroom and he couldn't get up. He laid there all night long till his uh, grandkids who call him every, every morning. Uh, when he didn't answer the phone, they went over, they found him. The good news is he did not break any bones. He's extremely bruised. He has a little bit of a bleeder in the back of his head, uh, very, very slight, and that was being taken care of as of Friday. Uh, he's under observation. It created some flare-ups and some other health issues he has. So he is at Fresno Community Hospital and uh, is going to be under observation at least until Monday. So they would appreciate you praying for Rick. Uh, Daniel Wilson is Jesse Lubbock's grandson uh, and Benita's son. They both attend church here. And uh, he's 35 years old. At birth, he had some kidney liver issues that required surgery. Uh, he's done very, very well for the last 34 years. And just a couple of months ago, his health began to decline. He got off of the uh, concert tour that he was on, came home. Uh, his mother watched him for a day or two and then called for an ambulance to take him to the hospital. They are saying he needs probably a double transplant uh, at 35 years of age. And so he also has been at Fresno Community Hospital. Uh, might be in Stanford. I did not get a call yesterday. And so uh, just please continue to remember to, uh, to pray for them. Uh, several to remember in terms of um, loss and in need of comfort. And um, Jason Weens is a service we have this coming Tuesday. He has served in our United States military, uh, still was in active duty when he died. It was not duty related. Uh, that service will be Tuesday. Uh, Paul Conan's mom passed away, Irene. How many of you ever shopped? Uh, it's not there anymore, but it used to be on Pulaski for several years near the barber shop, uh, and it was called uh, Cambria by Clovis. Remember that one? Uh, a cute little shop there. I bought a Western lamp, still, still in one of my rooms. Uh, anyway, this was his mom, and uh, they would appreciate your, your prayers for them. Mike Kalugian, uh, one of the biggest services we've ever here had at New Hope. Every place we could find somebody to sit in here. We had 140 people over in the bridge, as many chairs as we could get in there. And uh, it was a great day of celebration for Debbie's life. Continue to pray for Mike. And then this coming Saturday for Hope Cooper. That is Mark Down's 12-year-old niece. Uh, so please be remembering the Downs and the Cooper family. Um, when, when I think about Hope, she was born with a lot of challenges. Didn't think she would ever live past just a few weeks or a few months. She lived to be 12 years of age. They said she would never walk. Yet she got to a place these last uh, year and a half or so that she was able to walk sometimes 10 or 12 steps. They said she would never speak. She got to where she could do one word and sometimes two and three word sentences. And, um, uh, but she is now in heaven. And when I thought about that, what immediately came to mind was the song, If You Could See Me Now. And that is what Hope, I'm sure, is singing and celebrating at this particular moment. So that service will be here at New Hope next Saturday at 10 o'clock. So those are the updates. Uh, I was handed one today for, uh, for us to remember to pray for Nick Clay. Clay, raise your hands back over there. Yeah, all right. Um, he's going to North Carolina uh, in just a couple of days. He has been selected to be part of the, uh, to go through the training for the Marine Corps Forces Special Operations Command. It has been hurrah. This is something that Nick has focused on and has desired to do, and he's worked his way uh, to be prepared for this. Uh, though he's ready, he is nervous as the day is rapidly uh, approaching. So we've been asked to pray for him. 
uh, that he will experience the peace that passes understanding and the confidence that he will get through this next step of the process successfully. And so his name is Nick Clay. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they will wait on us at this time as we have our morning tithes and offering. Yeah, 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 come on up, come on up. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the life you share with us, and uh, thank you for your kindness and your patience with us. Father, we uh, trust you the needs that have been uh, expressed here today from those in need of care and comfort because of the experience of loss of, of, of people that they've loved, part of their family. Um, thank you for your sufficiency. Thank you for your availability. Thank you that you show up at every moment to meet our needs, and we trust you for these. For those who are facing health challenges, um, Lord, for Jesse Lovick's grandson, uh, we commit to his needs for Rick after his fall in his home. Uh, Lord, Charlene, Bernice's daughter, is with us today. That, that's, that's a round of applause. All right, guys, thank you so much. God, we're so grateful for how well Charlene is doing. She's been through so much, and uh, she still gets to enjoy life with us. We know that she has prepared for whatever you have next, but uh, from a selfish perspective, it thrills our heart that she is with us today. Um, Father, for the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thanks for that opportunity. For Nick, as Nick heads into a, uh, um, a brand new adventure in his life, one that he's longed for, but now is finally here, may he experience a peace that passes understanding. Um, Lord, for Cindy Weens and the, and the loss of her son, we commit to you her needs, and may she experience great comfort. For Mark and the Cooper family, Lord, we uh, trust you with their needs as we prepare uh, for the celebration, um, for the celebration of Hope's life. Um, thank you so much for all of your provisions for us in the past, for today, and for all of our tomorrows. We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So what does the family call him? What's the name I should use today? Grady, good old Grady. All right, I like that name. All right, and so we have Jeremy and Melanie and, of course, their beautiful daughter coming up, all right, that we got to do this for three years ago? Yeah, right at three years ago. So I believe you also have uh, parents here? All right, I'm going to ask the whole family to stand up for just a moment, all right? Ask the whole family to stand up. We can see all of you. Turn around, face the audience, all right, so I can thoroughly embarrass you. All right, perfect, wonderful. Thank you all. These are grandparents, great-grandparents, cousins, all right, so terrific. Thank you all for being here. All right, Miss Melanie and Jeremy, you've kind of been through this once before with me, so you know this really is not about Grady today. Grady is not going to remember one thing that happens today except for what you show him in a picture album, all right, which he'll be thoroughly embarrassed at 16 when he says, you did this to me, but thank you for dressing him up in that beautiful, cute little suit that he is wearing today. And uh, he is cooperating so nicely right now, all right? We hope that continues for the next uh, 120 seconds, all right? Uh, <laughs> but what today really about is about you as mom and dad. You make the request to have a baby dedication because there is a sense of gratitude in your heart that you recognize that this beautiful little boy that you are holding, this beautiful little boy that you get to put to sleep every night, this beautiful little boy who may disturb your sleep frequently at night, <laughs> that he is God's gift to you. And um, you want to give him thanks for that incredible gift that he has blessed you with. Also, Daddy will hold you. Yes, he will, all right? And so th this is really about your willingness to say, dear Lord, thank you for the gift of our son, just as you said thank you for the gift of our daughter. But it goes, bless you, but it goes beyond gratitude. It goes then to an offering. You are not being asked, as Abraham was, to lay your son on an altar and potentially offer him as a sacrifice. But God does ask, are you willing to give your son back to me? I have blessed you with him to manage and guide and direct and provide for. But are you willing to give him back to me? If I put a call on his life, or when I call him to be my own child, are you going to be happy that he wants to be a Christian? Are you going to teach him who God is? Not indoctrinate him, but teach him by the way you live, by the way you talk to each other as mom and dad and husband and wife, by the way he sees through your example that God is a priority in your lives, not a second thought. And so if you were willing to raise Grady 
in a home that recognizes God's sovereignty, God's sufficiency, and God's love, would you say we will? Are you going to pray for your son? Are you going to seek the joint prayers of your family to pray that Grady will be the man of God that God has already purposed and planned for him to be? Are you ready for us to have this dedicatory prayer for Grady today to the Lord Jesus? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Mr. Grady, oh, that is so sweet. What a nice big sister you are. You are so good. Did you know I held you just like I'm going to hold your brother? You remember that? It was so awesome. It was so awesome. Come here, Mr. Grady. Come see. Somebody's put lipstick on you. Yeah. Look at that handsome boy. Let's pull your, let's get it all down right here. Okay. You're looking good. I, I want him to see that suit. Okay. Look at that suit. Ooh, look at great grandma. Okay. I, I like it when they're happy like this. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you all have joined hands already. Just put a hand on each of my shoulders or your, or your son. All right. And let's pray. Would you join us? Father, I love you so much. I thank, thank you for these special moments as a pastor when we get to share with a mom and dad in this beautiful gift of, of, of life that you've given to their family. Thank you for Grady. Uh, Father, before he was ever born, you already had plans and purposes. Just before there was the creation of this world, the scripture tells us that, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had a plan of love and redemption for the whole world. You have a plan of love and redemption for Grady. He couldn't help the fact that he was born into a sinful world, but by watching his mom and dad, he's going to discover that God loves him so much that he wants to redeem him out of this world. Thank you, Father, that as he hears the truth, as he sees the truth, he'll make a decision about the truth. And we trust it will be one that will put his faith and trust in you. We are excited to see what you do in his life decades from now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Bless you, Mr. Grady. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Yes, I'll take you home with me anytime. And when you mess your diaper, I'll give you to Shelly. Um, all right, uh, we have two things for you today. First of all, we have a quilt made by our quilting ladies of the church. And uh, in one corner of the quilt, it says, God loves you, made with love by New Hope Community Church. And this is for Mr. Grady to snuggle. Will you hold it for your brother? Oh, thank you for doing that. And then we have the certificate which says, uh, Grady Allen Marion Borchardt was dedicated to God by his parents, Jeremy and Melody, on this day at New Hope Community Church. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And so just a memory of this day. Thank you so much for the privilege. God bless you all. Miss Emily, if you would like to grab your stuff and go right out that door and get ready, I'm going to meet you. Follow Linda. She's right over there. And uh, I'll meet you in the baptistry in just a few minutes. A couple of things real quick. First off, guys, this water is 94 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the remodels, right? Uh, it's no longer a hot water tank that's up there that we always have to get in the attic turned on. It takes forever. Um, this is a spa now. All right. So the water goes in in 45 minutes and it's heated, all right? I guess it'll go to 102. Uh, so it's really, really nice. It's good. Uh, so thank you for paying for it. Uh, <laughs> they should have put a few more jets in it, though. <laughs> um, baptism. If you're doing new hope, you say, what is this peculiar thing they're doing? Um, baptism is something that got started um, during the life and times of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus himself was baptized by John the uh, Baptist. Yeah, yeah, that's where the Baptist church got started. Um, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, he got called a Baptist because that's what he was doing. He was baptizing. And to, to do baptisms in those days uh, was far more costly than baptisms today. They weren't done in the confines of the church uh, and in a controlled temper, uh, temper, temperature environment. Uh, they were done in the River Jordan. They were done in a public place. And um, Roman guards could see what was going on. And because people professed faith in Jesus as God, that was a threat to the emperor. And their lives could be taken from them. It was very public, and it could be very, very costly. Today it's become more of a celebration and a party. 
uh, what this is all about is not a person, they're not doing this in order to become a Christian, but it's because they've already become a Christian that they want to follow the obedience to baptism. Baptism is a public statement about a personal or private decision that has already been made. It doesn't make you more of a Christian because you're baptized, but it lets the world know that you are a Christian. Uh, so it's kind of like a birthday party. You're celebrating something that has already happened. Miss Emily, would you come on in, please? Bibles, if you would please find the little book of Habakkuk. Uh, it is between Nahum and Zephaniah, in case you forgot where it is. Uh, if that doesn't help you, it's between Psalms and Matthew, all right? It's about three pages long, it's three chapters long, it's 54 verses long. Today we're going to be looking at the last three verses of the third chapter. So if you want to take the time to find it, Habakkuk 3, 17, 18, and 19, all right? Um, as you recall, this is a prayer, and I'm getting to the video in just a minute, guys, all right? Uh, this is a prayer. It's a conversation, a running conversation with God. It's the way prayer is supposed to be, all right? Uh, God talks, we listen, we talk. God listens, God talks, we listen. God talks, we listen, we talk, God listens, all right? And so we see this carried out in the book of Habakkuk. And when it starts in chapter 1, if you weren't here, Habakkuk, who is the prophet of God, he's the voice of God, he's the pastor of Israel, uh, Judah at the time, and he's whining and complaining. All right, chapter one, he is down in the mouth, all right? He is angry at God, he is frustrated with God, he, he's beginning to wonder if God even pays attention to him anymore. That's where he starts, and God can handle it. By the time we get to where we're going to be at chapter three, He's, his circumstances haven't changed one bit. Everything is just as bad in chapter 3 as it was in chapter 1. What's different is Habakkuk's perspective. 
his perspective of who God is, what God is up to, and that God continues to be faithful. Halfway through the prayer, Habakkuk comes back to a conclusion, the just shall live by faith, not by circumstance. And that revolutionizes his ability to see things as they are. Now, to kick off what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to play you a short little clip out of a concert. You're going to recognize who it is right away. You're probably going to go to the song right away, and uh, particularly since you are from Clovis, most of you. We let some of you sneak across the border from Fresno and visit us. It's okay. <laughs> But most of you will recognize and you will know this song, all right? And if you feel like it, it's not much trouble we're going to play. Go ahead and sing along with it, all right? Let's watch it. Today, we're not going to be talking about low places that we might be too familiar with, that we are naturally drawn to. But we're going to discover some things about high places that unfortunately we probably know too little about and we are rarely drawn to. You see, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 19, the last, the last concluding part of this prayer, Habakkuk says, The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds feet. We cleared up now. Does everybody know what a hind is? I didn't say hind, I said hind. All right? It's a, it's, a, it's a small deer, probably um, in that part of the world it would be more like a gazelle, all right? For us here in, in North America, uh, a mountain goat, okay? They have the special feet that takes them to the precipices, the highest, most difficult, and challenging places that you can get to. He will make me to walk upon my high places. For the last several weeks, as I've been reading them back three, four, or five times a week, and every time I come across that verse, I'm reminded of a book that I sold hundreds, if not thousands of copies of during my days at Fresno Bible House. It was one of those things kind of like uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity and the green padded cover Living Bible. It's just something you kept ordering again and again and again. And it was a book written by uh, a British woman by the name of Hannah Hernard. She was a missionary to India out of, out of England, and it's called High Speed on High Places. Just out of curiosity, how many of you in the room have ever heard of the book? Raise your hand. Okay, about a dozen of you. Great. How many of you have read the book? Okay, about four of you. All right, great. Um, here's a book I want to recommend. I'm going to take a couple of minutes out of the sermon, and I want to give you a little promo about this book because um, it's, I think it's a great book to read. This book is a, is a grammatical allegory. Y'all know what an allegory is, right? It's, it's the image of one thing and the picture of another, all right? It's a novel, but it's based upon biblical <coughs> principles. It's using a story to illustrate application. How many of you ever read Pilgrim's Progress by Paul Bunyan? Okay. Oh, good, good. If you, read, if you read that, you should read this. You would like it, all right? If you read any of the Chronicles of Narnia, you would probably like this style, all right? How many of you read Chronicles of Narnia? Wait a minute, wait a minute. All right, all right, all right. I don't know. I, I wish that I read it at your age. I, I, was, I was an old man when I read it. I was 24 before I ever read the Chronicles of Narnia. I read all seven books in about two weeks. I couldn't put them down. Uh, Hannah Bernard wrote this book in a very similar style. Uh, it was written in 1954, 55, continues to still be in print today. Here's, here's the way the story goes. It's about a young woman, and her name is Much Afraid. And her journey away from her family, called Fearing Family, is to go into the high places of the Great Shepherd. She is guided by two companions, sorrow and suffering. This is an allegory of a Christian devoted life moving from salvation to maturity. It aims to show how a Christian is transformed, not instantaneously, but from unbeliever to a mature believer to mature believer who walks daily with God as easily on the high places of joy as they do on the daily life of mundane and often humiliating tasks that could cause Christians to lose their perspective. This book takes its title from Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19. The story begins in the valley of humiliation, the low places of whiskey and beer. It comes naturally to us because we've got a lot of friends there. 
She's beset by the unwanted advance of a cousin, Craven Fear, who wishes to marry her. They were from Arkansas. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm from Arkansas. I just want to see if they're going to stay Much afraid is ugly from all outward appearance. She walks on club feet. She has gnarled, misshapen hands. She speaks from a crooked mouth that seems to have been made this way by a stroke. The Good Shepherd is tender and gentle with much afraid, especially in the beginning of the book. However, his many sudden departures may strike the reader as bizarre, given the human uh, expectancy to, to, to behave kindly, to never do anything that's rude or hurtful. Though the shepherd often leaves the scene in just a moment, he returns in the same way as much afraid and cries out, Come, shepherd, I am afraid. When much afraid intimates that she would love to be able to dance upon the high places as sure-footed deer, the shepherd commends her for her desire. In order to accomplish her desire, he offers to plant the seed of love into her heart. At first sight, the long, black, hawthorn-looking seed looks fearful, and she cries out, much like a cross. <coughs> it looks to us as a place we have to go to discover the love of God. <coughs> Soon she relents and says to the shepherd, give me the seed of love. And after the initial intense pain, she senses that something is now different inside of her. Though she still looks the same for the moment, she knows she's not. Just when the reader thinks that much afraid is about to reach the high places, the path turns suddenly into an endless desert. There's an incident with an extremely high cliff that must be ascended, though it has a steep and slippery slope and a zigzagging track. With the help of her two companions, sorrow and suffering, she makes it. Then days are spent in the forest that is shrouded with a thick cloud of fog. During this time, much afraid, is sequestered with her two friends in a log cabin, and the climax is an unexpected twist that comes as much afraid despairs over reaching the high places. I'm not going to tell you anymore because I want you to read the book. The book comes from a back. The story of a back is the story of moving from being trapped being triumphant. Chapter 1, chapter 1 is as bad as it gets in Habakkuk's life. He thinks God has forsaken him. He thinks God has forgotten him. He thinks God does not care one thing about him. He is trapped. You ever been there? You ever felt that way about God? You identify with Habakkuk. By the time we get to chapter 3, verse 19, not one thing about the fact that circumstances changed, but he is no longer praying as a man who is trapped, but he is now worshiping as one who is triumphant. That's available to you and me. We just have to learn the keys. This verse speaks to me of spiritual mountaintop moments in our life. Though okay, God may not want us to live on the mountaintop 24-7, for that's going to be our experience when we get to heaven, and this certainly ain't heaven on earth right now. Trust me. Still, I believe that it is the purpose and the plan of God that His children experience many mountaintop moments. This passage is full and running over with wonderful truth, and I hope with God's help today, we'll figure a few of them out. I want to discuss three things over the next several minutes. Number one, I want to talk about the divinity in pronouns. Now, when I say the word divinity, what jumps in your mind? Don't say candy, please. Okay? My grandmother was playing a great divinity candy every Christmas, but that's not what I want you to think of at this moment. When I say the word divinity, what do you think of? God. Okay, good. That's good. Uh, for those of you who weren't thinking that, please do, all right? Because we're going to talk about the divinity of pronouns. Number two, we're going to talk about what are spiritual high places. Kind of define that so we all understand. And number three, how do we get to those spiritual high places? How do we move from tract to triumphant? So let's first of all jump in the divinity of pronouns. Martin Luther, and I, I, I discovered sometimes I throw words and things out and I want to make sure we all understand who I'm talking about and who I'm talking about. All right? 
When I say Martin Luther, you all know who I'm talking about? Okay. And it's okay to raise your hand on this one. If I say Martin Luther, do you, do you recognize the name, but you have no idea why I would be quoting you? Does that fit any of you? I have no idea. Okay. Um, and I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. No, though he's a good man. Terrific guy. All right? The, this, the original Martin, and Martin Luther King was named after this Martin Luther. All right? And he was named after him for a reason. Martin Luther was, was originally a Catholic priest. Okay? Uh, very influential. Very powerful. And, and, and one night, Martin Luther did something very unusual for the priest of his day. He read the Bible. He read the Bible. And he read the book of Romans. And he read the passages of how we are saved by faith. He read where there was no longer an intermediary between us and God except the Lord Jesus Christ. And he found out that people didn't need to come to him so that he could go to God on their behalf. And he didn't need to go to a priest higher than him. So he, could, he said, I can talk right to God. And everybody can. And, and so he went to tell another priest about it, but they didn't like it. And so do you know what Martin Luther wrote? It was called the 95th Thesis. Google it on his day. Do it this afternoon. The 95th Thesis. And he presented his... his New doctrinal high place. Do you know what he did with that? He nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg Church. <coughs> that time the most influential Catholic church in the world. And he said, I'm nailing it to the door because I'm not going to enter it anymore. <laughs> and I want folks who are here to read what God has said. And that is how the Lutheran Church got started. Named after Martin Luther. Luther. Um, if, if John Longstaff were here, he would tell you he's a recovering Luther. These <laughs> are believers in Jesus Christ. Many Catholics are believers in Jesus Christ. All right? I'm not, don't, don't jump on me. I think I'm inferring something different. But it requires, whether it's Catholic, Luther, or Baptist, or anything else in between, you've got to believe in Jesus. It's through Him that we come to a relationship with Him, but not through. Our religion. So that be done. Martin Luther was often heard to remark about divinity in pronouns, and what he meant by that um, is it makes a world of difference to us. Let me see if I can illustrate. The Lord is a shepherd. The Lord is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The difference of those three little words is of great spiritual benefit. All right, a and the is very different than my. Um, another illustration. There is, um, th there might be an amazing Ford Raptor pickup truck out in the parking lot. You drove it the last two days. You didn't drive it today? It's resting. Okay. There are, there is at the Boss Garage an amazing Ford Raptor pickup truck. That is far different than saying that is my Ford Raptor pickup truck. I don't own one yet. One expresses a fact. They are an amazing vehicle. The other one denotes personal ownership and relationship. In the scripture we're looking at today, we will notice the prophet uses personal pronouns four times. God is my strength. He will make my feet. He will make me walk my high places. It's one thing as a believer when we recognize God is able to do certain things, and it's quite another when we appropriate those things for ourselves. Jesus is a Savior, or Jesus is my Savior. I believe that even though the prophet was speaking about his own personal relationship and his own expectations about God, that you and I can, without any harm to this passage, we can claim this as our own. In other words, the me and my that Habakkuk said in this verse, I can say about Tim and you can say about you, if indeed Jesus is your Savior. It's the same way that what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.12 can also be true about you and me. That's when Paul said, I am suffering, yet I am not ashamed. Because I know in whom I have believed, I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which I've given to him for that day. 
Do you have that kind of confidence in God that what you have trusted about your life to him, he is able to keep and preserve? Paul said it, but you and I can claim it for ourselves today. Though there are many personal pronouns in this verse, again, we do no harm if we appropriate for ourselves as individuals that we can trust God with our salvation. So having established that, we can claim this verse, Habakkuk 3.19, just as Hannah Hernard did as she wrote her book for ourselves. What do we mean when we say that God will make me to walk in my high places? I want you to understand very significantly here, it says my high places. Shelley's high places may be different than my high places. And my high places may be different than a taller Tim version high places may. He can't go to as many high, he can't go as high because he'll bump his head. All right? Uh, all of our high places are a little bit different. So let's talk about for a few minutes what are spiritual high places. Some think the, the, the prophet might have been speaking about the physical return of the scattered Jewish people back to the hills of Israel. I don't think that is what he intended because they really hadn't fully been scattered yet. Babylon is about ready to come and do that for them. To me it makes more sense, since this is a very personal prayer about Habakkuk, that, that the prophet is speaking about God bringing him to a personal spiritual high place no matter what life may throw at him. No matter what low places he may be in, God is saying to Habakkuk, I can pull you out of the low places and I can take you to the high places. Um, let me see if I can give a few examples of spiritual high places, but I want to reiterate that we need to see all of this from our own personal perspective. What high places does God have for you? Does God have for me? Paul speaks in Ephesians of standing until that evil day and beyond. I believe every one of us has days, has a day that will be the worst day of your life. My prayer is, is that every one of this room, that day is behind us. I hope our worst day is not still ahead of us. But in like manner, I think we all have days, plural, that will be the best days of our lives, and I think they are still ahead of us. The prophet says he will make me to walk upon my high places. Notice that's plural, not singular. I believe God plans many delightful days for his children. So let me quickly list a few high places in life. Number one, high places of personal communion with God. You see, once you and I had a sin-darkened heart, we were alienated from the presence of God. But there came a day when God took away our heart of stone and its place, he gave us a heart of flesh. We looked at this in our last sermon series pretty extensively. He opened up, God opened up the treasury of heaven and he placed within our life his one and only begotten son. And on that day that we gave our life to Jesus Christ, the angels of heaven sang and they threw a party in your honor and mine. Our hearts jumped for joy. We shook off the chains that we just sang about. He took away our filthy rags of unrighteousness and he put in its place a royal robe on our back and he put a ring on our finger to identify us as his child. What a day as we used to sing, what a glorious day that will be. This was a high place in God. And since that time when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, there hopefully has been other glorious meetings with the Savior. Like when the disciples, after the resurrection, were on the road to Emmaus. Has your heart ever burned again with God speaking to you? There have been, there have been many of those moments, and I will tell you, most of those moments, have, many of those moments have been right here in this building. They've happened at certain moments of worship. I'm sure it's happened to you. There have been moments that a song we've sung a hundred times before all of a sudden does something to me, and the tears just begin to flow or the laughter just begins to bubble up. It's a special moment between God and us, even though a whole lot of other people are around. I remember one really weird moment that was just like a little bit of heaven had come down into a car. Uh, I think Shelly John and I, or Shelly Robert and I, were coming across the desert in Arizona and get, believe it, listening to a um, Kenny Rogers CD. Okay? One of his got best CDs ever done is a gospel CD he did for Cracker Barrel. And man, just, just, it was like the presence of God just broke my heart and lifted me up. Another one was on um, uh, opening day of dove season. I was in my mid-20s. If you don't like dove hunters, I'm sorry. Um, but, but my cousin David, uh, he was stationed in Sacramento at the time, and, 
and uh, he got a couple of days off uh, from the Air Force and he came down and we, we were going out and we were, we were meeting up with some other friends of ours uh, that, that both of us had known all of our lives and it's well before sun up and we're driving you know 180 Keynes Canyon Avenue out through Minkler and Centerville and heading towards Reedley where we have our place to, to hunt and, and all of a sudden David and I who'd been very close all of our lives David starts here and Tim let me tell you how God got a hold of me he started telling me a story. I knew David was a Christian, but David always kind of walked the edge a little bit. And man, he started sharing his story, and God started working in my life, and I started telling David some stories. And man, it was like we both shouted in the car. I know it sounds weird, a couple of 25, 27-year-old young men, but it was a moment of sweet communion. It was a high place. Like Moses who on the top of a mountain was able to see the backside of God and get a glimpse of his glory, like, like Zacchaeus, who rejoiced in having Jesus Christ come to his house for supper. This should ever be the highest of our high places, and that is communion with God, and that's why I've listed it first. We must always be diligent so we don't lose our first love, like the church in Ephesus did in Revelation chapter 3, all right, 2 and 3 where God talked about the church at Ephesus. He said, you are a good church, and he listed all their fine qualities. He said, but I got one thing that's a problem between you and me. And Jesus said, my problem with you is you've lost your first love. You don't love me as much today as you did the day you gave your life to me. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. When was the last time you had a high place of personal communion with God? The good news is that God never intended there to be just one or two or even a hundred such meetings. If ever God intended there to be a plural spiritual high place, it is the high place of personal communion with Him. Then there's the high place of brokenness. Revival or renewal is not the top blowing off, but it's the bottom falling out. We are never so high in God as when He brings a deep spirit of conviction and contrition to our hearts. Psalm 51 is probably one of the most glorious chapters of the Bible. It's the story of, of, of David coming to the end of himself, realizing that his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband was wrong, and he needed to deal with it in his life. And so David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Isaiah was in a high place of brokenness before God when in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 he says, Woe is me. I am a man who is undone. The bottom has fallen out of my life because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of unclean lips. That's Garth Brooks singing, I got friends in low places. And Isaiah says, But mine eyes have now seen the king, the Lord of hosts brokenness men often look to enjoy the spotlight when God seeks to get us under his searchlight David wrote in Psalm 51 17 the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart this you will not despise O Lord and Jesus said in Luke 14 for whoever exalts himself shall be brought low and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. This next high place is one you're going to think is so weird. <laughs> I do. I think it's really weird. How about the high place of sucking honey out of a rock? Did you know that was in the Bible? It is. A high place of sucking honey. It's in the Song of Moses. In the book of Deuteronomy 32, it's found specifically in verse 13. It says this, He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of a rock and oil out of a flint stone. And I don't mean Fred. Okay? <laughs> You're awake. You're awake. See, it's truly remarkable spiritual high place in God when we are led by His grace and it causes us to be able to suck honey out of a hard place like a rock. God brings us blessings in places that the devil intended for cursing. As when Joseph was sold into slavery, it turned into a blessing. But God has a way of enabling us to do this in our own lives when we simply stand in awe of His majestic power. 
what some mean for evil, God can transform it for our good, and we find the sweetest of honey in the hardest of rocks. It's what Paul meant in Romans 8, 28, all things work for good to those who will love God and trust his purpose. In chapter 1, Habakkuk, I think, still loved God, but he didn't trust his purpose. By the time he gets to chapter 3, he remembers. I'm going to come back, I think, next week. I'm just going to hit this in passing. Um, there's a word used in chapter 3 three times that the only other place you find this word is in the book of Psalms, the hymn book of the Bible. You'll find this one word used three times in Habakkuk 3, and it's used nowhere else. It's found in verse 3, verse 9, verse 13. It's the word selah. Selah, it's a, it's a musical term, all right? That's why it's found in the book of Psalms and not hardly any place else. And, and what the word sila means is pause and think carefully. And Habakkuk uses this three times in the third chapter. Instead of just being angry at God, he's realized in tough moments, I need to pause and think carefully. And the first time he uses it in verse 3, he's talking about renewal and revival. The second time he uses it in verse 9, he's talking about remembering God's faithfulness. And the last time he uses it in verse 13, he's talking about how God has restored him to a right place in a relationship with him. So what I learned from that is you and I, we need to pause and think carefully about the wisdom of God. The next high place is a high place of sacrificial giving. Abraham had such an experience when he offered Isaac on the altar. Do you not think that was a high moment for Abraham? Abraham, man, was concerned about all this the whole way up, and yet by faith he said, I believe if I put my son on this altar and I raise the knife to take his life, as you are supposed to do with a sacrifice to God, that God is going to do one of two things, one of three things. God is either going to stop my hand, God is going to raise my son from the dead, or even at 125 years of age, God is going to give me another son. Because God promised me I would be the father of a great nation. And don't you know the joy and the celebration that took place with Abraham when that hand was stayed and God provided an alternative sacrifice? He was excited then as you and I were excited when we discovered we don't have to go to a cross because Jesus has already done it for us. He's provided a substitutionary sacrifice for you and for me. Sacrificial giving are high places for us when we learn to give of our time, when we learn to share our talents that God has given us with, and we learn to share our tithe. Perhaps there's a missionary or a neighbor who has a need that you can meet. God challenged you. He directed you. And, and it was wonderful when you did, when you were so fearful of, if I do this, what is it going to take away from me? Do you remember how God dealt with you to be a generous in your spirit and to finally surrender him and to giving your time to help that person that you didn't really have the time to help? To give of your resources, to, to put, man, I don't want to volunteer to be part of the worship team. They got rehearsals. They got two services on Sunday morning. I don't want to volunteer to be an usher. I, I do that, then what are they going to ask me next? They might want me to be a deacon. Wow, that would be tough. When is the last time you gave over and above your abilities? And guys, please understand, if you've been here very long, you know I rarely talk about money. And when I talk about this, I'm, I'm, that's one small portion. We give of our time. We give the, the, the talents that God has blessed us with. Use them for his kingdom work. Um, David walked in this kind of giving through most of his, uh, of his kingly years. He spoke of not offering the Lord that which cost him nothing. In other words, David said, I'll only give to the Lord that which has value and cost me personally because my God is worthy. Paul walked in the high places of sacrificial giving and he taught under him to do the same thing. Let me move on. There was a high place of forgiveness and mercy. Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they parted his raiment and they cast lots. 
When we as a believer have been wounded by another and we've been cut deep in our hearts and from our innermost being flows not the wrath of bitterness but the forgiving grace of the Lord Jesus, this is a high moment in God for us. Someone has said that the forgiveness is a, uh, the fragrance of a flower that it gives off after it has been crushed. May such sweet aroma flow from us in moments when we've been crushed. We've been talking about forgiveness for about four weeks in our Thursday morning men's Bible study. We've looked at it, man, in, in, in a depth that I, I didn't know was possible. The thing that we discovered out of our discussions and, and investigation of the scriptures about forgiveness was this. The Bible says that you and I are to forgive each other in the same way as God in Christ has forgiven us. And, and we, got, we got pretty serious. We had some very honest dialogue in our conversation. We had, we had some, some guys who said, hey, I don't know that I could ever forgive a child molester. It's a pretty honest confession. I don't know I could ever forgive. And, we, we, and, and, and what we finally discovered is we kept looking at the Scriptures. We are to forgive in the same way that God and Christ has forgiven us. What sins did Christ die on the cross for? Is there an exception to the all? Not a one. And so if you and I are to forgive each other in the same way that God and Christ has forgiven us, and if we say we can't do that, then do you know what we are ultimately saying? We are saying the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was not adequate for all sin and it's not functional in my life for the sins of others you understand that to say that I can't forgive somebody else for what they've done to me is to say his sacrifice is inadequate and insufficient because the scripture says we are to forgive in the same way not similar not kind of like not almost in the same way way then there is the high place of praise and worship that's what we do together on Sunday morning it's what we did last Sunday night as we sang that very same song it's what we do sometimes in the privacy of our car and sometimes in our own home we do it in small groups we do it in public events Paul and Silas were in a high place of worship and praise inside a prison cell and God through their worship allowed a prison guard to come to know Jesus Christ let's talk about briefly as we wrap this up I got to bring this home in about five minutes how do you and I get to spiritual high places you see it is one thing to stir up people to seek high places in God it is another to give practical steps on how do we get there I believe this passage provides a couple of practical guidance number one Habakkuk says the Lord God is my strength we must understand we do not do this on our own. We do this by the grace and influence of God in our life. The Lord God is whose strength? My strength. Spoken in direct connection to climbing to high places. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The scripture says that God will make my feet like Heinz, like Heinz feet. God will do a transforming work in my life when I recognize that he is my strength. Secondly, there is a trust cooperation that needs to take place between us and God for us to get to the high places. I'll be very honest, a straightforward reading of this passage in Habakkuk, it seems to place 100% of the responsibility on God. He will make my feet, he will make me walk on the surface. There is nothing for me to do. God is the one who seems to be doing it all. While there are some things that are wrapped up in the sovereignty of God, there are other things that our response to God, our free will, plays a pivotal role in how all this fleshes out. That is a very hard to see. It's very hard to see that in this passage where we read God gives us hind feet, makes us walk on high places. As it helped understanding the role we have to play, though it's a very small one, for God is the one who does the heavy lifting, let me ask you a question. Earlier I talked about high places of personal communion. Does anyone here want to say that God makes us have personal, private, devotional time with him? Does God make you get up a half hour early to do that? Does God make you stay up a half hour late? Does God make you chisel out some time in your day so that you can have devotion and prayer with him? I've never had anybody tell me he makes them. I've had people tell me I wished he would make me. It'd be so much easier if he did. Does God make us pray? Does God make us forgive? No, 
but he nudges us and he whispers us in that direction. And sometimes the prodding can be very strong, but he never forces us. It is our yielding to those prompts that cause us to grow in our relationship with God. Earlier I said that God gives us hind's feet. I purposely used that expression, though I was misquoting the scripture. I wanted to make a point here as I wrap things up, because it's incorrect to say that God gives us hind's feet. The text is clear. It doesn't say that God would give us, but God will make our feet like hind's feet. There is a vast difference between the two. The gift of hind's feet requires no effort but that of receiving the gift. Making feet into hind's feet requires that we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in us in this process. For you see, feet have to do with our walk in God. And though God greatly enables us in our Christian walk, He doesn't force us to walk. Now let's get most practical. How does God do this? How does he make our feet like hind feet? I think it's simple. The Spirit draws as we seek after him. He enables us to climb higher in him. What I'm saying is this. Even as a weight trainer begins with a small amount of weight but develops a habit and a pattern of exercise, the muscles develop and more and more can be lifted. What used to be tiresome is now child's play. Even so with our walk in God, consistent daily prayer, consistent daily time in God's Word, consistent worship and fellowship with His family will enable us for God to make our feet into hinds feet to climb to the higher places of God. been in physical therapy three times since my knee surgery. When I went on Friday, I was doing the little exercises they gave me. She said, Is those, are those really easy? I said, yes, they are. She said, let's put a two-pound weight now and see if it's not quite so easy. And then she said, okay, let's put a four-pound weight and see if it's, it wasn't so easy at four pounds. See, the purpose was uh, I, I, I could either not go to physical therapy, do it on my own, or I can go to physical therapy and follow the directions and experience really wonderful benefits in high places. You, God is asking us to cooperate with his leadership. I've been to Montana with Jerry Molinari uh, uh, six or seven times now. First time I went with Jerry, first day out, we didn't go very high. We walked a nice trail. We saw some beautiful things. Second day out, we went to a little more strenuous place. We actually walked on a trail that was only about 18 inches wide with a 3,000 straight drop off right down to our left. We had a little uh, uh, line, uh, metal line that was in the side of the wall that you could hold on I until the last 25 yards and that had broken off. And um, Jerry looked at us and said, I've been on this many, many times, follow me. And I followed him. And I saw some things I'd never seen ever before. Two days later, he says, guys, you see up there? That's where I want us to go tomorrow. Now, what up there meant was there was nothing higher than there. There were no other peaks. There was no glacier higher than that. It took us above the tree line to just shale. It, it was something like 48 swishbacks to go about 75 yards. That's how steep this was. We got to the top. One member of our party lost his visual cue and just fell to the ground because everything was off balance for him. When we got to the top and another young man, my cousin John, was with me. We were standing literally on the top of the world at that place. We looked down 5,000 feet below us. Big sky. Now I know why they call Montana big sky country. Gigantic. High place. But see, I would have never gone there the first day in Montana. I wouldn't have gone there the second day with Montana. But because I'd followed Jerry in some other places that had taken me higher each time, by the time we were ready to tackle that one, I was ready to follow Jerry because every time I had followed him, the end result was incredible. 
And that's the same thing God asks us to do. He's not going to take us to the highest place the first time out of the chute. He's going to take us a little higher and a little higher and a little higher as he transforms our feet into those of Heinz feet. God wants us to have high places in him, but we must trust him. Notice the difference of Habakkuk's attitude of trapped in chapter 1 to triumphant in chapter 3. Jesus says to the church, Behold, I stand at your door and knock. I want to have communion with you. I want to take you to high places. But you've got to love me. We might have friends in low places, but we have a Savior who calls us to high places. Have you ever had a high place of personal communion with God? Can you say with full assurance, the Lord is my shepherd? If you haven't, you could do that today. Is there a desire in your life for God to help develop your spiritual feet into Heinz feet? Are you feeling challenged in any areas that we've talked about as spiritual high places, places of brokenness, of sacrificial giving, of forgiveness that extends mercy? God wants you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenge to follow you into the high places that you have for us. You often take us there in ways that we couldn't imagine. It's often on a course or a trail that uh, we would not normally take. Often it's not, even, it's not even choices of our own planning. But Father, we willfully follow you because we've learned to trust you. And when we have forgotten, may we practice sila. May we pause and think and come to the conclusion as Habakkuk did, the just will live by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.